to begin adding our sprite artwork to our project, the first thing we of course need to do is we need to load those images. So we'll make a image variable and I'll call one player art and one enemy art. Now we need to populate those and in this particular endeavor as we do this when we populate them we're not going to be displaying them just as an image we're going to be showing part of the image so let me get to the end of my setup here I'm just going to add a so when I'm scrolling up and down through things, I know what's there. All right, so player art is now gonna be equal to load image. And I put my images into a data folder. And that is something that processing prefers if we do it that way. So get in the habit of doing it. It's a good idea to stay organized so that you have your files properly organized. All right, so I have now loaded my artwork. So what we're going to need to do is we're going to need a way to display only part of this image at a time. So instead of using the image command, we will be using one of the methods that goes along with pimage and that is copy. So we can copy the specific pixels on our sprite sheet and only show those pixels at any given time. To accomplish that we're going to need to add a few things to our project and one thing that we will be doing because we're using pixel art what will be better as we work with this is we need to switch from float to int. So instead of having floats, our number of values should be integers. That cleans it up when we're working with our different methods here. So don't forget to switch your floats to ints there. Now we need a few more properties to work with this. And one of those will be we need to know what is the current frame we're on. Then we are going to need to know an offset when we work with the character sprite sheet. Our unicorn sprite sheet doesn't have an offset, but we're going to code it the same right now so that we're able to just move this code from the player class into the enemy class and they'll both be able to do it. With this we have offset, and we need to offset by you know our horizontal amount, offset x. We need to offset our y, the vertical component. So again, on the character sheet, we have to do this when we're choosing which character we want to be looking at. We need to have our total frames. We need to know which row we are currently in, because remember these are stacked in rows. So each grouping of sprites are based on rows so the characters we have our rows that correspond to uh, down left right up the unicorn is set where it has right left up down so we need to know which row we will be grabbing artwork from and then we need to know where in the sprite sheet we are grabbing it, so our source X and our source Y. So these are all values that we're going to need. We'll end up needing a few more down the road, but right now let's just start with these to get the process going. So our new values here. Current frame, we're going to start out at zero. So remember computers like to start counting from zero, so we always begin that with zero. Our offset X is going to be, in this case, our offset is zero, and then we multiply that by the width of our sprite. Then our offset y is going to be, in this case, zero, and we multiply that by the height of the sprite. So if we were dealing with the characters, if our offset, we would have to know how many we're moving over. So if we want to move 
over to the next character. So 0, 1, 2, 3, so we'd have an offset of 3. If we want to go down and say grab the bat, then it would be 0, 1, 2, 3, 4. So we'd have to know what we need that offset to be to grab our correct entity. And we'll see that when we, we'll play with the different values when we work with animating the enemy sprite. And then our total frames, and I put a comma because I was looking up in the line above, and there's a comma right after total frames. And the total frames, in this case for the unicorn, when we work with it, we remember that is four by four. So our total number of frames of artwork that we have is indeed, well, it's not, it is 16, but the total number of frames is how many frames are in a walk cycle. That's what we actually need to know because that's what we're looping through is we're looping through those amount of frames. And then we have our source x in this case is going to, we'll just start out at zero and our source y is going to start out at zero. Now source x and source y are modified by offset and then they change as we grab because we're going to copy the pixels of the first frame then copy the second then the third then the fourth and then we go back and copy for a second third fourth and we just keep repeating that. So that is how we go about beginning the animation process. And looking at this, I do notice that I missed one at total frames. I forgot to put in my row, and the row I'm going to be working with is the first one. So we have that row set. We're gonna change rows based on direction in just a little bit, but first what we want to do is kind of get this working. We wanna get it animating. So I'm gonna keep drawing the rectangle so we can see what is the active area for this. Um, I'm just going to make that color a little more transparent. So we'll just say 100 on the alpha. Now, what we do to work with this is we say copy. What we're going to be copying is from the player art sprite, the unicorn here. We'll copy off the player art and we'll grab our source x plus our offset x. Then we'll grab our source y plus our offset y. And then the area that we're trying to copy, in this case it does correspond to our width and our height. So technically I could scale up the 16 pixel version of the characters. I could scale it up here by making it bigger because we can display that work bigger or smaller, but it it loses something in the transmission when you do that. And then we end with, so the first part is we, we specify what image we're working with. Then we specify where in the image and how much of the image we're copying. And then we specify where we want to place that and how big we want to place that on screen. So now if we just run this, we'll see that the unicorn appeared. So it has indeed appeared right there on screen. So now, I mean, if I wanted to make this bigger, I'll just double up just so we can see how these values are working. It now puts it there, but when I scale it up, it's not clean. It It's chunky. It does fill the 64 by 64 square, but it would be better to make our whole game smaller. If I did want all my artwork to be 64 by 64, I should do that in Pascal, or I should scale it up in Pascal so it scales the pixels clean without creating the fuzzy, ugly edges on it. So hopefully this helps you to understand there are the three components. We have the sprite, we have the area that we're copying and the area that we are, and I'm just putting these all kind of on separate lines here to emphasize the three parts. So the artwork we're working with, the area of the artwork that we're trying to copy, and where we want to put it on screen and how big we want to put those copied pixels. So it's very similar to the image where image was just x, y width and height, but now we're able to just copy a portion of an image area. So that's where copy really is a powerful way of working with this. 
So the next thing that I want to do is I want to update my artwork. So we update our position information, all that beginning position information, but now I want to animate it. So I'll just put a comment on that this is now I animate stuff. So what we have to do is we have to say our source x is going to be equal to our current frame and we multiply that by the width of the sprite. So once again, if we start out, our current frame is zero, we multiply it by the width of the sprite, that's the left corner. If I want my next frame, if my current frame is now one, one times the width of the sprite, 32, that means my x moves over one column. So that's how we're able to update it, is by updating current frame. Now our source y is going to be equal to our row multiplied by our height. And that matters because we will change rows based on which direction we are facing. So we can do that if we look up here, we can see how I'm able to change my rows based on the direction that I am facing. So if I'm going left, we can see that's going to be the second row, which has the value of one. Our first row is zero, so it's zero, one, two, three. So row equals one for going left. If I'm going right, that means it is row is equal to zero. And if I'm not going left or right, I don't have to do anything. Now if I'm going up, we can see our row is equal to two. And if I am going down, my row will be equal to three. So you can see how we're able to put those in. So now let's run this and see if anything changes. So I, we can see it's changing. It's not animating, but I am changing through my four different frames of artwork. So that's a good first step is that we're able to change which row within this sprite that we are accessing. So yeah, I think it's good we can look at it in this manner. So now we want to cycle through those frames. So the way that we're able to cycle through our frames is we need to start updating current frame. So we have two ways we can do it. I can say current frame plus plus, try again, plus plus, that means current frame go up, but we only want current frame to go up to the total number of frames. Once it's that big, we need to set it back to zero. So we go zero, one, two, three, zero, one, two, three, zero, one, two, three. So we want to create that loop. So I can use an if statement and say if current frame is equal to my total number of frames, meaning it went up one too many because total number of frames is four, then we need to say current frame is equal to zero. Oh, and I didn't mean to have triple equal. We want to double equal there. All right. So now if I run this, we'll see that it's, it's going, but it's going really, really, really fast. So it's working except that we do want, when I'm not moving, when I'm not moving at all, I don't want it. So if I'm not pressing a key, if I'm not actively pressing a key, I want it to stop animating. So we can do that. If we just go up here. So before we update our position, so we can say if not left, and not up and not right and not down. So if we're not pressing any of the keys, put in closing curly brace, up arrow, then we say current frame is going to be equal to, in this case, we'll just say zero. We also know that if we're not pressing any key, we want our bx to be equal to zero and our by to be equal to zero. These are things that you know, don't matter as much for the player on the speed part, but it does really matter when we 
work with the enemies and they start chasing us. So now let's run it again. You can see it's not twitching until I'm moving and now we can see it's going, but it's still, it's going super fast. So I want to slow it down because I only have four frames. I don't want it to go quite so quickly. So we need to put a delay in this. So we're going to add two more variables into our project. So I'll go int, I'll call one hold and one delay. And let's go give those some values. So hold is going to be equal to zero and we're going to set delay equal to four. Now this number four is something you can experiment with. You can make it slower, you can make it faster. Uh, if delay is smaller, it loops faster. If delay is a bigger number, it slows it way down. So you need to figure out based on how many frames of artwork you made, how much changing is happening in that artwork for how you, you need it to slow down. So that's something you're going to have to figure out as you do this. So what we can do with that is we only want to update our current frame when so much like current frame is going 0, 1, 2, 3, 0, 1, 2, 3. Currently we're going to have hold going 0, 1, 2, 3, 0, 1, 2, 3 like that. But we want to update current frame every time hold is 0. So we're effectively creating a little timer that slows it down using our frame rate. So we're not accessing the clock on the computer and doing an actual time-based timer. We're doing more of kind of a update cycle or frame-based timer on here. but. For the purposes of this kind of project, that's okay. So I could do hold plus plus and then wrap it all in an if. Uh, but there's a shorthand way we can write all of these lines that we just did here. And it would look like this, where we go hold is equal to hold plus one. And then we do the modulus math app operation and we'll divide it by the delay. So what this does is it says hold starts out at zero. We say hold is now equal to, and then we go hold plus one. Hold plus one is one, divided by delay, delay was four. So one divided by four is going to be zero with a remainder of one. And now hold is equal to one, one plus one is two, two divided by four is going to be zero with a remainder of two. And then hold plus one will loop again and it will be three, three divided by four is zero with a remainder of three. So the modulus math operation allows us to keep the remainder value. We don't care how many times it divides into it, we keep the remainder. The next time, hold is now four, because three plus one is four, so four divided by four is one, remainder zero. So we went zero, one, two, three, zero, one, two, three, zero, one, two, three, because we're only keeping that remainder value. We don't care how many times it goes into it, we're keeping that remainder value. So we use this one line. So these lines here, 67 to 70, the current frame plus plus, current frame equal total frames, can be rewritten a little bit shorter and I'll show you how that looks in just a second here when we get to it. So if hold is equal to zero, what we want to do is simply say current frame is equal to current frame plus one, then use the modulus where it's a percent sign divided by total frames. So this one line accomplishes everything in those lines. Now if these lines are easier for you to remember and you're like, that just makes more sense to my brain, go for it. I'm going to keep the shorter line though because I like this better. So remember the modulus math operation means we keep the remainder. We don't care how many times it goes into it, we just keep that remainder. So it's a perfect way to do a looping set of numbers. In this case, they're both going 0, 1, 2, 3, 0, 1, 2, 3, 0, 1, 2, 3. But if I replay my project and start walking, you can see now it looks like the unicorn is starting to actually 
walk a little bit more instead of look kind of spastic. So that's better. Now if that is too quick and I want to slow it down, I could slower, if we slow our delay down to eight, watch this. So again, based on your artwork, the speed your sprite is moving across the screen, it's going to vary how much you want that to. So now by having my delay too slow, I would argue it is, it doesn't look like it's walking anymore. Now if I slow that delay down to one and run it again, we'll see how it's going to suit. Wow, that, that almost hurts the eyes. That looks really bad. Let's just go for two maybe. So it's super fast, but okay, that's kind of comical. If I didn't have the background square around it, I think it'd be even more comical to watch. But four is really, based on my artwork, based on the speed it's moving, seems to be a decent compromise for how quickly we want these sprites to update. So we've been able to update the player sprite quite handily now, just based on setting up our animation using the copy statement and putting in these new variables.